This is Sarah Russell, hosting a special episode of Trends with Benefits inspired by the new HBO series, The Last of Us. The Last of Us is an action-adventure game turned TV show that follows Joel, played by Pedro Pascal, who's a smuggler tasked with escorting teenager Ellie, played by Bella Ramsey, across a post-apocalyptic United States. In the show, humans have been infected by a mutant cordyceps fungus, transforming its human host into the aggressive infected. Today, I'll be talking with Matt Held, Senior Research and Development Manager at Mudwater, who works on developing and producing our products, as well as researching the science and efficacy behind everything that goes in mud now and in the future. And that includes cordyceps. We're going to talk about what the show gets right and what the show gets wrong about mushrooms. Hi, Matt. Welcome to the pod. I'm excited to dive into this with you. I'm really excited, too, and and thank you for having me. Absolutely. Thanks for being here. First of all, have you watched the show, and what do you think of it? I have watched the show. Uh, Just watched episode three the other day. Um, I love it. It's right up my alley. It's I'm way into the sci-fi fantasy and throwing some mushrooms. I mean, it's exactly what I need. Plus Pedro Pascal. Like, I'm a huge Star Wars Mandalorian fan and Big Game time. of Thrones. And like, ah, <laughs> yep. So good. Absolutely. So good. I'm a big fan of him as well. I'm a huge sci-fi fantasy nerd, but I have to tell you like zombies are not, <laughs> not quite my thing. Like if, if we're talking like team vampire or team zombie, I'm going to go team vampire all the way because like if you ask somebody like, oh, would, would you ever want to become a zombie? Like people are going to go, no. <laughs> but if you ask people if they want to become a vampire, like people are like, mm, pansexual life forever. Like sign me up. So yeah. I love the mushrooms. I love Pedro Pascal. I love Bella Ramsey. Um, but zombies are hard for me. So I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, like curled up with my blanket, like all the lights on, like trying to watch it. But yeah. I mean, I'm enjoying it. It's fun. I, anything post-apocalyptic or dystopian, like I'm in. I think even like recently, I, I watched The Walking Dead and that got old after a couple seasons. Like we find the characters is interesting, but a zombie is a zombie is a zombie. And it's just like, we get a zombie. It wants to eat brains. But the show takes that little bit of a twist with the mushroom and like takes it, takes it to somewhere zombies haven't been in like on the TV and live action, which I think makes it kind of... A little bit different than just like brains eating zombie kind of thing for me anyway. I completely agree with you. And that twist that it takes is actually part of the reason I was resistant to watching the show at first, because Mm. I was like, okay, we're having a moment with mushrooms, with medicinal mushrooms, with magic mushrooms. And everyone's like having this mutual love affair. And I was like, you're going to come after our magic in this moment? (laughs) And like, I get it. It's an effective hook. Like it made all of us interested. But I was like, is now the time to be doing this? Yeah, right. Yeah, it's an interesting twist. There's so many conversations that uh, things that I'm not as familiar with, but conversations that this show has brought up even outside of our products, like in the medical industry, talking about fungal infections and highlighting like how we're really not ready for any sort of like big fungus issue. Oh, interesting. Um, I'll try not to go into too many like crazy details here, but a fungus, a fungal cell is very similar to a human cell and that they're both eukaryotes. So they're different from like a bacteria or a virus. So it's hard to come up with a medicine that's going to impact that fungus and not impact us. So if you do get an internal fungal infection, like that's that can be a really big problem because there's not a lot of options for treatment. So it is kind of scary. I actually, like, I just got chills from you saying that. That's, that's <laughs> kind of terrifying. And I, that's not information that I knew. Thank you for sharing that. That's really Do you watch the show? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I watched the first episode. Um, yeah. It was a lot. My best friend told me that episode three is a game changer, that there's like this incredible love story in it. And I'm a mega romantic, so I'm going to grit my way through more zombies feeding on humans so that I can get access to this love story. Um <laughs> I'm going to stay in it. Like I'm, I'm curious about where they're going to go. I, I trust Pedro Pascal and Bella Ramsey, so I'm going to keep watching, but I'm only, I'm only one episode in. I only watched the first one so far. I'll try not to to spoil anything. And maybe that should be a disclaimer here. It's like, there there might be a couple spoilers. And if you don't want that, um, is it, is it okay to tell people to stop listening to a podcast? I I think just do a little like spoiler (laughs) alert. Just be like, Hey, for the next, for the next 10 seconds, we're going to be talking about, the thing. 
spoiler alert, uh, Nick Offerman is in the third episode, and I I love Nick Offerman. He did such a good job. I mean, I'm not much of an emotional person, but I know people are are crying about the third one just because of the story that he's in, and like, it, I could feel it. Like he did a really good job at portraying this a post apocalyptic romance sort of mm. thing that you probably really expect out of a zombie movie, but I'm mean, they just killed it. Absolutely killed it. I love him. He's part of the reason why I'm willing to dive back in despite my terror <laughs> because I yeah. want to see what he has to do in all of this. For sure. I sorry, I went off on a tangent there. Uh another spoiler, episode 2, in the very beginning they uh when this research person is kind of dissect or doing an autopsy on on one of the victims, she freaks out cuz she she sees mycelium in there and she knows it's a fungus. She's I think she's some sort of fungal expert. And the military is like, well, what are we going to do? And her reaction is bomb the city, like uh, just wipe it out. And there's a, that's a super extreme reaction to that. But like the little nugget of truth there is that we, we're not well prepared to deal with a big internal fungal infection. Like, and her reaction was kill everybody, but right. you know, the other options aren't awesome right now. Right. I mean, this is what happens in the middle of a crisis when we have no win-win solutions and there are no good options. Um, obviously, obviously, I would be on team resistance for a move like that. <laughs> <laughs> try to Maybe figure, try like, to build some walls or something first before you kill everyone. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you know, there's, a, there's always a way. I like to believe, but that might be the eternal optimist in me. But speaking of how terrifying this is and what fungal infections would do to us, should we catch one and like all of the terrible decisions we would have to make and whether you would be on team revolution or team military, like all of that, <laughs> is it actually possible for cordyceps to infect human brains? It is not possible. I mean, just like zero. Flat out impossible yeah um even if the climate warms even if the planet gets warmer like they posit in the movie or in the show that yeah, that is the premise right the 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 earth is warming and the the fungi all fungi everything is adapting to that warmer temperature and it is true that one of the reasons that an internal fungal infection doesn't happen that often is because our body is warm and the the fungus can't really adapt to that and it it can't survive on top of our immune system is also really well equipped to take care of fungus so you usually only find them on the outside of your skin like in moist crevices or whatever don't know if i can say that on a podcast but in like you know in 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 weird moist folds and crevices. stuff in your skin moist <laughs> this is gonna have a not safe for work 18 plus uh tag on it i'm sure on spotify <laughs> anyway what, what was I talking about? You were talking about how fungus tends to be on the outside of the skin, moist, moist crevices, mo moist, moist environments. Moist. I just keep saying the word moist now, um, but it's not actually likely that it would be able to take hold, even if the planet was warming. Right. We have a we have a very good immune system, and usually a, a blood fungal infection happens in immunocompromised people. So if you're already sick with something, so it's it's not something that happens to a healthy person to begin with. On top of that. It takes a long time for these mushrooms to evolve that capability to do anything. And as far as I know, there is only one very specific type. It's not even a cordyceps. It's a DNA relative of cordyceps that does this to ants. There are other cordyceps that can infect insects and does do infect insects, but they don't turn them into zombies. They just, they grow on them. These beautiful fruiting bodies come out of the top of them. It's beautiful and horrific and everything all at once, but... In that case, the insect really isn't any different than like a, a log or oats like we use in, in muds, mushrooms. It's just food. Really, there's only one specific mushroom that can do that to a very specific ant. And even in that case, it can't do it to other ants. It needs to be a specific ant. So maybe give it a couple million years, like familiarize it with our, how our body works, and maybe it could do it then, but it, it couldn't just simply hop species like that. So we're not even getting little ant zombies, let alone people zombies. Well, that's kind of the interesting part is that they, they do call them zombies, but they're not zombies how we think about like a bloodthirsty, gonna lose your mind, run really fast and eat people zombie. Really, they're, they're vehicles for reproduction, which I think sounds a little nicer than zombie. 
<laughs> sure, sure. When you were saying like they're not going to run, it just reminded me of another zombie movie, Zombieland, where like the first mm-hmm. rule in Zombieland is cardio. Like you have to be able to run fast. Uh-huh. That's what that reminded me of. But I want to circle back to something you said where you actually said fungal infections in the blood aren't very common, except it can happen in immune compromised people. And I just like want to take a moment to sit with that because we're in the middle of a pandemic that's still going on where a lot of people are moving forward as if a pandemic isn't still going on. And what I'm hearing from the immune compromised community is that there's a little bit of this like being left behind like as we're moving forward. And so like, I just want to take a moment where you're going like, yeah, this isn't likely to happen, but fungal infections are happening in the immune compromised community. And so like, I'm not sure how much that translates into this like horrific arc being like more realistic, but I just like wanted to name, like there are people that are already suffering from something kind of sort of like this, like not to the level of horror, but like they are having to deal with fungal infections in their system. So it does happen. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And I think that's one of the cool conversations coming out of the show is that people in the medical industry and people that are focused on uh, fungal infections are using this kind of like how we are to talk about mud products in a way, but they're using this to, to highlight that that deficit in, in medical treatment and to shine a light on the people that usually wouldn't even talk about unless there was a zombie fungus show. Wow. I think that's like my favorite part of the show now is the fact that that's actually a conversation that's emerging from all of this. And I had no idea. Yeah, it's really cool. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. (laughs) Of course. Okay. So we have this species of cordyceps. It's cordyceps that are infecting everybody on the show. How does the species of cordyceps on the show differ from the ones that we're eating in our mud products and our supplements? So the ones that we're eating are a, a different species. The one that typically is eaten for, for medical reason, not medical, but health benefit reasons is uh, Cordyceps militaris. Um, this, some species of that Cordyceps can grow on insects, but the the actual zombie, zombifying Cordyceps is called Ophiocordyceps. Um and it is, it's a DNA relative. It branched off from cordyceps at some point. For a very long time, it was thought it was just a, another uh, type of cordyceps. But once they started doing DNA analysis, they saw it was a close relative, but actually pretty different. So there's, there's no actual cordyceps that could turn us into a zombie. Um, the cordyceps that we eat has an active component called cordycepin, not very cleverly named, but easy to remember. It is an, an adenosine analog, and we eat it because uh, adenosine is part of how we get energy and how we move and how everything functions mm-hmm. in our body. And by absorbing this adenosine, we kind of trick our body into thinking, we're about to make more energy. Let's make more energy. So you're kind of lighting the fire under the energy creation process in a way, which is really different from how ke- caffeine works because caffeine, you're tricking your mind to thinking that you're not tired, so you keep right. going. Whereas this is this alternate avenue of to spontaneously creating more natural energy within you. Oh, I really like hearing that distinction between caffeine and the cordyceps because this idea that caffeine's blocking something. So we're actually like ignoring the body singles, signals versus creating something that's actually giving us access to something additional. Yeah, for um, sure. That's interesting. Very interesting. It also has, I mean, most every mushroom that we eat has beta glucans and other polysaccharides and things that are great for stimulating the immune system. So it's, it's got multiple benefits, um, really worth consuming, really worth uh, bringing into your diet if you can. I love it won't that. take over your body. <laughs> it won't It won't take over your body in a bad way. It'll only take over your body in a good way. Right. It'll right. only be helpful, not harmful. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Okay, so I've taken cordyceps into my body. I'm healing myself or like using some kind of medicinal purposes. Fantastic. That's great to know. I'm going to take a sip right now and get some more in my system as we speak. What are you drinking? Actually, I don't know if cordyceps is in this one. I'm drinking the matcha right now. It is in, in matcha. Yep. It's in matcha. It's in uh, balance and cacao. Okay. So it's just not in the rest. Got it. Not in rest. We don't really want to be energizing like oh, in the yeah. evening time. So that one has reishi and turkey tail, which are calming, immune supporting more than kind of like get up and go. Nice. Fantastic. <sighs> okay. So... This is a little bit of a spoiler, but not too much. It's just like the intro scene of episode one where Joel, Pedro Pascal, and his daughter are 
like in the middle of this crisis unfolding. Like we're in real time, like it's just starting to hit. Everyone's realizing what's happening. And they're trying to escape the small town that they're in. They're trying to get somewhere else. They're trying to get away from it. And the daughter goes, what if it's everywhere? What if we can't get away from it? What if there is no getting away from this? And so this mutant fungus has spread widely. And what does the show get right about how mushrooms spread? And what does it get wrong about how mushrooms spread? So it definitely gets wrong, uh, a part of it wrong when, especially in episode two, so spoilers again, Mm -hmm. it it really highlights how these infected are spreading their infection through mycelium. And in reality, mycelium, mycelium does a lot of stuff. It's actually incredible. And we could probably spend a lot of time talking about mycelium, but one thing it doesn't do is reproduce. Like that's, that's the purpose of the mushroom on top the fruiting body. That's of anything that you could put the mycelium on, like you could have it digest stuff, you could have it uh, talk to things, it does talk to things, it, it regulates stuff, it um, it binds to plant roots, it does so many things, but the one thing it doesn't actually do is reproduce. And I think the show uh, kind of went a different direction than the game. I haven't played the game. I would love to play the game. I want to play the game, game now too. I heard it's like, it's very cinematic. It's supposed to be like one of these groundbreaking, like new ways that a game could be developed. I was in the middle of grad school and had no budget for a new console. So yeah, unfortunately I missed it. I rely heavily on my brother for all the new consoles. He's always got the latest, greatest. (laughs) But in in the game, as I understand it, uh, the fungus spreads through spores, which is how it spreads in real life. So the game is, is a bit more realistic um, from what I understand, the spores, you know, when you're in the game and you're in a, a heavily sporulated area, a, very, uh, a lot of dense spores in the air, they put on masks. So I could see like during action scenes or you're just walking around, like if all your actors are in a mask, that kind of I isn't see. great for a show. Right. <laughs> Although Mandalorian, he's in the mask all the time, so it could have worked. It could have worked. <laughs> he does just I fine. Understand. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So it kind of makes sense that way, why they did mycelium. But one thing that they do get right about the mycelium network in that show is that it's used for communication. So spoilers again, in the second episode, they come up to, I believe it's a museum, and they find some some remnants of the fungus and they touch it and it crumbles. You're like, oh, this is dead, so we're fine. We can step on this. Later on, they come to a more fresh scene and they disturb it somehow. And you see these little tendrils wrap up around a dead guy or an infected guy's finger in a way that it seems like, okay, something's about to happen. They're communicating. And then you find out, okay, through, through this mycelial network that's underground, they, the fungus talked to all of the other infected people outside and said, there's, there's food in here Mm -hmm. come in. And then of course you have your classic zombie, everyone running and main characters are dying and all sorts of stuff. But that, that is very much how uh, mycelium works. It, it does communicate through its its underground root network. I mean, this is one of the things that's so interesting about the show for me is I, I love that about mycelium, that it talks and it talks to the environment. It talks to like this, this wide acreage. And so, you know, like on a psilocybin trip, when all of a sudden you're feeling like one with earth consciousness and like you're like, we're all connected and... Um, you know, one of the visualizations that I use when I want to hold more ground, when I need more space in my body, when I'm working with a client or when I'm going through a difficult moment, like I imagine that I'm the mycelium, that I can spread out and hold all of that ground. And it's this very peaceful, like comforting. And so for the show to turn that into something terrifying, <laughs> very compelling. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's very beneficial for the ecosystem, to your point. Like, the show did turn it into something evil, but uh, evil from our point of view. But if we think about it, like, really the purpose of this fungus isn't to destroy the human race. It's to survive and reproduce, like, every other fungus in, in most organisms. We're only putting that evil point of view on it to romanticize and uh, personify it. But in reality... In, uh, ecosystems benefit greatly by having that mycelial network connect to other mushrooms and to plants. They can, they talk to plant roots, um, mushrooms and plants can exchange nutrients. They can exchange water. They can exchange sugar. And uh, just because they're connected in that way. So it's kind of like this little farmer's market underground where things are just going back and forth. It can communicate across the mycelium to a plant. Like if, if there's an injury or if it found new food, like 
it's really wild how how beneficial that is. And it does this by binding to the plant roots. So when it actually binds to it, it causes a little bit of an infection because you're, you're binding two living things together. There's going to be a little bit of, of friction there, but that stimulates the plant's immune system, which helps to strengthen it. And then it, it's better prepared for like if a disease comes through. If it's connected to a mushroom, its its immune system is stimulated. It's it's ready to go. It's more likely to survive. So it's the mushroom is just like altruistically taking care of everyone and taking mm. care of itself at the same time. And it's that's really uh, the more I read about it and research it, it's just like every every further level down is something really interesting and, and cool. I love that. And also sounds a little bit like um, a homeopathic dose of something, or even I know like there's there's a lot of, of theories around why acupuncture works, but like part of it is you're, like you're inserting a needle and then you're like making the body want to have a healing response to the point of insertion. So like even this idea that it's like injuring or wounding in some way, like versus like it's stimulating a healing response or it's stimulating some kind of beneficial response, like through that little that little moment. Yeah, I like that's that. awesome. So now that we know that it's not evil, <laughs> it's not evil. What are the benefits of using cordyceps in our diet? Um, I mean, the the cordyceps that we talked about and the the beta glucans really are are the key uh, usage for these things. It's each mushroom mushrooms can do a lot of things, um, but kind of each each one of the functional adaptogenic mushrooms get their their little area to play and cordyceps is very much in the energy area. Um, so you do usually associate it with the, the energy boosting, but it brings the immune stuff as well. Okay. So immune health as well. Yeah, for sure. Fantastic. Is there anything else you would like our listeners to know about cordyceps, about the show? Anything you would leave our listeners with? Yeah, I could keep going for forever, but I think I love <laughs> one that. thing that was, that was kind of interesting that we didn't touch on too much is, is how the, the fungus itself takes over the ant. Um, Because, I mean, everyone's talking about how that happens and how it could never happen to a human. But there are other interesting conversations around that. But the the mycelium, when it takes over the ant, it grows throughout the body. It uses it, it digests its insides to use it as food. But I think it was a couple of years ago, maybe five or so years ago, a research came out that showed it didn't actually uh, physically overtake the brain it left the brain alone and it could manipulate it with chemicals, which a a mushroom mind manipulating chemical to me, just is like psilocybin comes to mind first. So like this idea of like, what is this ant experiencing? It's already so hard to know what an ant experiences. Brain is obviously very rudimentary. We don't know what it's capable of feeling, but this idea that like the, the fungus may actually care about the ant in a way that it's it's doping it with these like <laughs> these chemicals maybe it's tripping maybe it's feeling good maybe it's horrified i mean i have absolutely no idea wow. but i don't i think it's such a cool thing to think about like we've talked a lot about how good fung- uh, mushrooms are for the environment this is kind of one more thing like and that's super romanticizing personifying it but there's a possibility that it's trying to take care of this ant it's like i'm sorry i'm doing this to you but i i need to do this to survive but i hope you're having a good time. <laughs> wow. That is such a trip. Yeah. It's so interesting it too. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. We just don't know. So that's the thing. Like we're telling all of these stories, right? The last of us is telling a story. You're telling another story. That's like a little bit like maybe the aunt is having like a rave. Like maybe it's having like this amazing experience. It's really interesting thinking about like, we actually don't know what all of the possibilities are yet. Yeah. I was going to say the same thing. Like it's, it's fun to think about and uh, it's, I don't know. It's really cool. Love mushrooms. <laughs> I love mushrooms. I love mushrooms. And it's been really great talking to you about mushrooms. It's been really great talking to you about the show. Looks like I will keep watching it. It sounds like you're going to keep watching it. it. sounds like it's exactly your thing. Oh, um, totally. But let me, when you get to episode three, let me know what you think. I feel like that's, it's such a departure and yeah. it, it, it's such a good episode. That's what I heard. I heard like episode two goes like full hardcore zombie, but then episode three is something else. It's something unique. It's something different. Yeah. hundred so percent. It's definitely got my interest right now. <laughs> 
Well, thanks for all of your insights and assuring us that we can defiantly drink our mud water while we're watching this zombie show. It's been so wonderful talking to you. And I'm sure we'll talk to each other again since we are both such microphiles. And I'm really looking forward to that. Me too. Thank you so much for having me.